You're listening to Agile Ideas, the podcast, hosted by Fatima Rabucci. For anyone listening out there not having a good day, please know there is help out there. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Agile Ideas. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Fatima, CEO at Agile Management Office, mental health advocate, and your host. On today's episode of Agile Ideas, we have Mr. Brant Cooper. Brand is a New York Times bestselling author of The Lean Entrepreneur and also CEO and founder of Moves the Needle. He works as a trusted advisor to startups and large enterprises around the world. With more than 25 years of expertise in changing industrial age mindset into digital age opportunity, he blends agile, human-centered design and lean methodologies to ignite entrepreneurial action from the front lines to the C-suite. As a sought-after keynote speaker, startup mentor, and executive advisor, he's travelled the globe sharing his vision for reimagining 21st century organisations through agility, digital transformation, and a focus on creating value for customers. He helps leaders navigate the uncertainty brought on by increased complexity and endless disruption. You can learn more about Brandt at www.brandtcooper.com. Please join me in welcoming Brant to the show. Hi, Brant. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's um, it's really been great seeing um the the increase in in people being able to do more of these, especially with um, such a rise in remote working over the last few years. It just seems like everybody is reachable, no matter where you are in the world. And I know we're on different sides of the world, so yeah, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, no, it's definitely a cool part of all this technology as much as everybody gets zoom fatigue and whatnot still the ability to connect with uh, people all over the world is is pretty amazing absolutely absolutely um i like to start by asking you something that happened to you last week that either was really exciting or really frustrating something that happened last week oh wow uh be honest, the, the only thing that comes to mind is that uh, that I found out that my my cancer has come back in in my liver, which had disappeared for a little while, and so um, so I, I guess that would go on the negative side, not exciting, but uh, but it is what it is, and and so you know I'm dealing with that, but that's that was that kind of puts to shame anything else that might happen last week. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's- thank you. And thank you for keeping the time and having a chat with me today. So I appreciate it. Oh, yeah, no worries. Listen, I'm, I I try to stay active and engaged with people. And I mean, that's it's not a time to uh, to shrink away. So I just got back from playing pickleball and uh, and, you know, life goes on as as normal as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you do a lot in the mindset space, so um, positive mindset all the way. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and, and how do you, you got to where you are today. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, I, I, uh, like everybody else, most everybody else, I left college and got a couple of jobs and, and maybe not like everybody, I was sort of like, wow, this is the rest of the life. Is this what it's like is to just go in and, and sort of get into this nine to five slog. And, and so I guess I was never that way. I, I dropped out after a couple of years and wrote a novel, even though that didn't do any good. But, uh, when I, one of the characteristics that I talk about when I was working was that I was maybe not a very good worker. I managers, you know, sort of tossed me around like a hot potato. Nobody wanted to manage me. So why was that? Was I not an A player or whatever they call them? Um, and of course, really what it was is that I wanted to do things my own way and uh, wanted to be able to exercise my creativity and my intelligence. And lo and behold, that's sort of what everybody wants to do, right? So I I ended up joining my first startup in the late 90s in the San Francisco Bay Area. And voila, I sort of discovered, wait a second, there really are companies that the way they work is expecting people to exercise their intelligence and their creativity and to solve problems, not just be uh, told what what to do. So so that was really sort of my first, I don't know, epiphany in in that regard. And uh, after the dot-com crash, I was writing about that and also really why are we trying to squash that in startups? In other words, we were we tended to try to teach startups to act like big businesses where all of that sort of thing is lost. And of mm-hmm. course, 
Agile was probably just emerging in those days. And I think it was developed by people in the startup scene, mostly, who were developing software, who also were like, why are people telling us what to do when we are the ones that know how to do it? And yes, we need to be held accountable, but uh, but let us go do our job. Mm-hmm. And so I've you know sort of started writing books on on lean startup and customer development and agile principles, and ended up uh, writing several books on that, and started a company, Moves the Needle, that brings that sort of mindset, that entrepreneurial spirit, to very large organizations. Um, and I guess, you know, sort of the last book, the epiphany was, is that this isn't just for tech. It's not just for software. It's not just for startups. It's really that we live in a digital world now. And so all companies need to manage and uh, and conduct their work differently. And and so that's that's what it's about. And I'm, that's what finds me here <laughs> with you all. It's it's um it's really interesting. Uh, most recently, uh, I, we sort of will be writing some things around agile in banking, which is an industry I've spent a lot of time in, and it's so fascinating to me how many people believe that agile is purely about IT. And I get that it started there with some really brilliant minds coming together and trying to find more effective ways of doing things, but it's so much more than that. And I know we're going to get into that, especially with your product um, background, but just resonating to sort of what you described, I do feel that in sort of large corporate, the reason I left six years ago was because there was a constant sort of quashing of ideas and suggestions and that entrepreneurial spirit that I think a lot of us have. Maybe not everybody has that personality and maybe has that drive from an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial perspective, what do you think um, businesses, big businesses, should do or could do to inject that entrepreneurial spirit so that they can be, you know, basically get keep, keep up with the times with the startups that are absolutely blowing them out of the water in some instances? Yeah, well, I think it's um, I think the threat to them is actually not startups so much as all of the other things that are disrupting business these days, things like the pandemic and supply chain shocks and ransomware. And and to me, that's really what my last book was about, is that those are the disruptions that are going to interrupt our normal course of business. And that's the new normal. That's not going away. Mm -hmm. And so, again, to me, agility is the the answer. I think that there's a lot of people that recognize that, leadership in companies that recognize it. But they only know how to do change from the top down. And Mm -hmm. when you're talking about this sort of change, it's behavior change. And it happens to happen from the, the ground floor up. And in order to get the ground floor to start behaving in these new ways, Mm -hmm. you need different incentives and different metrics and different inspiration and a a sense of trust between them and their managers that allow them to make mistakes and to figure things out. And so I think that we're just sort of in this long slog now of trying to reestablish the relationship between people and their bosses. And it's just absolutely amazing how COVID and remote work kind of drives that home, right? So the the worker doesn't want to go back to the office because they've realized that they can manage their whole complete life differently and they can get their job done half the time. Managers, on the other hand, hate that they're at home because they can't see that their person, their their employee is sitting in front of the computer for eight hours as if that's necessary to achieve their their job. So I think that that I think that we've got a trust problem in there, and I think that that has to be overcome. I typically counsel people to start by forming a team, so you're not managing individuals and trying to get them more entrepreneurial. You're doing sort of Jeff Bezos, Amazon's two pizza team, mm-hmm. and you're signing them a challenge in some way that's going to have an impact on the business. It doesn't have to be innovation or something big. It could be. Mm-hmm. Hey, our design group's not getting along great with the manufacturing group or Mm -hmm. our sales scripts aren't working anymore. I mean, so anywhere, this is the key, anywhere where there's uncertainty. And so it it requires leadership to do a little bit of self-awareness and evaluation going, okay, well, where, where do we face uncertainty in getting our job done? Let's spin up a team whose sole job is, not sole job, whose job is in addition to what they're doing is solving that problem. And and the hope is, is that by empowering a team to do that, you start building the trust that allows mm-hmm. the manager to start delegating decisions to that ground floor, grass root level uh, of employee. Yeah, 100%, 100% agree. I, I resonate with everything you've said. It's so 
um, it's so prevalent in conversations with these large organizations that we've got this amazing strategy and they're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for big strategy packs that are 200 pages long that nobody can actually translate into action. Um, right. And if you're doing it from the top down and you're not connecting to sort of the people that are on the ground, they're actually going to deliver on these um, strategic objectives. You, you don't move forward. And enforcing rules and behaviours around how people work, I like to call it trust working, um, is far more important than fixating on um, what people are doing on an individual level, but rather how, as you pointed out, bringing them together a team and, and building that sort of team morale where the whole team wins and uh, fails or succeeds together, which I think is really the heart of what Agile is all about. So uh, can really resonate with all of what you've said. Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. And I, I think that the there's so many other benefits to this team. A team will hold other people accountable for their work, right? There's a social structure there that's important. And a matter of fact, if people are working remotely, they actually miss that social structure. And so the team, again, can reinforce that. Uh, you have maybe different abilities on that team. And so young people are getting the mentoring they need in terms of skill set. Um, uh, ethics even, you know, I think when we get into the digital world, it's more important that we're not just leaving our values on the website, but that it's built into our work. And so, again, a team is going to reinforce that and start creating that culture more than a manager is who's really just trying to uh, achieve their, their goals. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I think that the managers end up be, being more proactive. They don't live their lives always managing and reacting and so that they get to be more pro proactive and they get to be more strategic themselves, which is what they really want. Yeah. So I think it really is a win-win and can start creating this virtuous circle inside of organizations that lo and behold, the companies become closer to their customers, uh, move faster, are able to change based on new information. And, and all of these things are, are what's required in the digital age. Yeah, absolutely. And I think when you when you build um, solid teams, it's about keeping them together. I find a lot of organizations are constantly changing the makeup of teams, which disrupts that flow of work. And that like like in a sports team, you build up over years, the players working together and they're consistent. They, you know, they coached along the way, but that team together, you don't change players, you know, regularly. And I think that organizations are moving people around so frequently that it disrupts that flow of work in the team, which is also a big gap. Yeah, I agree that it's, I think they just kind of don't know what to do. You know, organizations have been organized around function because of, they really were an extension of the assembly line. So it really is just exactly as if we were doing, you know, Taylor's science of management and we're going to figure out how to structure a company based upon that. Mm -hmm. And all of the information lived in the center of the company and all the decisions were made in the center of the company. And if you were going to make a, a Model T, you could have it in any color you wanted as long as it was black. And so there's no variation. There's very little uncertainty. And so you can see why you would organize a company that way, because you mm -hmm. want them to do it the same way tomorrow as they did it yesterday. And I'm going to manage people so that they do that. Mm -hmm. If you flip the world over today, it's yeah. an infinite number of models and colors and, and the whims of customers and, and changes in the economy and things kind of, you know, it, the uncertainty and the complexity is so great. The information resides on the edge of the company, not in the center of the company. And so you actually have to flip that pyramid over and decentralize the decision making mm -hmm. and also purposefully build the communication flow so that the right information is getting to other parts of the organization, including the top and the middle. They still, of course, need that. Yeah. But uh, it, it's interesting. It's not a coincidence that this is when Agile rose. Uh, software companies were, or software teams were the first to encounter that sort of reality. And now, like you mentioned, it's not just R&D. It's everybody inside the company. And I think one of the things that people mistake is that if you organize based upon missions and you had an agile structure, well, there's some people that don't want to work with, that way, but mm -hmm. a large part of the organization is still going to look the same. It's just that mm -hmm. you got there differently. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you arbitrarily organize based upon function and all engineers are going to go do this, well, organize agile, most of your mission statements when building a product will be all engineering. And so then you're comprised composing the teams of the people needed to accomplish the mission. So in the end, it might look differently, but what it allows you to do 
is build in the cross functionality and the interdisciplinary nature where that's needed uh, because of the uncertainty uh, or the or the complexity, and that's the difference. Because to do that today requires you working across silos and trying to get some a designer who's all filled up, and you have to go and mm -hmm. get on their calendar or a product manager or an engineer, mm -hmm. and it's so inefficient. Yeah. And so uh, this is what digital companies by nature do better: is this ability to uh, to work agile. But again, it's not. The agile doesn't mean cross-functional. Agile means that you have the ability to form a team based upon what's required for the mission. Absolutely. One of the things I like to, <clears throat> to say, Brent, on this space is like when I think about the space that I play in, which is really, um, you know, it, it, there is a lot of work that I do around agile delivery, but there's actually a bigger component on agile governance. Um, and one of the things I, I'm constantly telling clients is, if you think about it, the, the typical company has a you know large portion of people that understand project management fundamentals, 101. They do it, live it and breathe it. But then even today, before Agile sort of rise, there was people in the organisation in other departments or other functions that don't understand project management already as it stands. Then you add the layer of Agile, which even Agile enthusiasts, even like me a few years ago, was trying to get my head around all of the various methodologies and ways of working. So now you're asking the functions who don't do delivery as their core to try to understand this agile thing that even agile enthusiasts can't get agreement on. So they have to empathize and understand it's it's um, it's much broader um, of a challenge than people are making it out to see. So I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, but that's definitely one of the ones that I constantly are talking about. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And, and really when I talk about agile i often do it with a small a because i don't really want to get into the wars about the different ways of implementing it and if you're going to make an agile team agile or a, a hr team agile they don't need the same sort of all of the same sort of structures that you know maybe an r d team needs and so we don't want to be dogmatic about a particular approach what we want to be able to do is go back to the to the manifesto and the principles that this is based upon and allow those teams to really organize in the way that best best suits them. It's just the idea of them defining their work and checking in with their stakeholders, including customers or internal customers, and and looking back and trying to improve the way they're working. And this, I I, I sort of my my mascot for Agile is the meerkat because I'm trying to just tell people that listen, how often should you lift your heads up like a meerkat from your work, take mm -hmm. in new information, and then decide whether you need to change any of the work that you're doing on. And that has resonated with so many people because people are like, well, it doesn't matter what you do, you ought to be doing that. And of course, that's the difference, right, is that we mm -hmm. don't tend to do it. We tend to just kind of get into this execution mode. And, and whenever there's uncertainty, the managers are just like work harder, execute harder, instead of taking the time to pause look at the environment, evaluate whether you're doing the right thing. If you are, fine, put your head back down and go to work. But if you're not, let's take a little bit of time and do some exploration work and figure it out and we'll get to the end goal more efficiently. A hundred percent. And I think um, what I like to say is guardrails, not control. I, I'm working a lot in the project management office space. Many, many PMOs are trying to figure out how do we put control and put, as I as I like to say, put the... Um, put the governance into agile, whereas they need to put the agile into governance. And that's all around providing some guardrails because we know that in organizations, regardless of what methods we want to use and the way we want to work, there are some fundamental things that we can't get around, you know, whether it's CapEx rules for finance or how we hire people, whatever it might be. So they need to form part of the guardrails that teams need to be aware of up front. And then you need to give them the autonomy and freedom to be able to work within the team the way that they think is best suited for them and their personality types and, and things like that. Yep, exactly. Yep. And even those even those that own the guardrails or the governance need to be able to do continuous improvement. So they're yes. they are like you know, developing empathy for the people that they're establishing the guidelines for, and they're running experiments to try to figure out if there's a better way of doing it, or maybe there's some technology that will help, or maybe the technology is what's causing the problem. But so again, it's sort of their ability to reevaluate how they're applying 
the principles that their job function says are important. So that's great. Yep, we got to do it. But let's reevaluate every once in a while whether we're, we can improve the way we're doing that. A hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. I like to call it micro projects. You know, PMO is running micro projects, which might be a one week experiment to actually test some concepts and things like that with the stakeholders, as opposed to imparting new rules on the teams. Having an empathy is absolutely critical. I um I wanted to um get a bit more um feedback from you around one of the things that you say is around changing industrial age mindset to digital age opportunity. What does that sort of, if you can elaborate a little bit more on that for listeners, that would be great. Yeah, so it's really pretty much what we were just talking about. The, the industrial age mindset, again, is sort of the information lives in the middle. It's top down, command and control, do what I say. And, uh, you know, the digital age is, that doesn't work when you're faced with uncertainty and the complexity of today's modern world. If you are, you're in execution mode and your core business is executing away and then the pandemic hits. Well, the pandemic isn't destroying the innovation team. The pandemic is, is destroying your core business. And if so, all you are is an executor and you have to work today the way you did yesterday, you're mm-hmm. in a lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. And so it's really just this idea that you have to build in the ability to explore. And so the exploration way is a way of describing uh you know, developing empathy, understanding customers deeply, running experiments, testing assumptions, trying to cut through your biases and all of those type of things that that startups do. So that exploration part has to be built into the core business. So I, I don't know if you track this, but in the innovation industry, they love to talk about exploit versus explore. Mm-hmm. And exploit is supposed to be like 95% of the business and there's no uncertainty and you're just off you go. And then there's this little pocket of exploration over in the innovation group. But again, that's not reality. That's not mm-hmm. how things work. Everybody faces uncertainty and you have to have the, the safety to learn. You have to have the, the ability to run experiments and try to figure out what the solution is. And this is what's crazy to me. Leaders say that they don't have time to do all of that. And I'm telling them they're, you're going to get to your desired outcome faster if you use exploration to make your execution more efficient yeah. and it's just too scary for, for many of them. A hundred percent. And I find a lot of the time working with leaders that the main challenge is they haven't taken the time to understand what the broader teams are doing. So, you know, rolling out agile transformations. I mean, agile is not a transformation. It's iterative, you know, r- rollout of change, uh, but they're running them as big transformation programs and the people at the very top aren't actually spending the time to understand agile, small A and big A agile to actually be able to you know, talk from a place of knowledge, um, which is also a challenge. So I think they're forever, totally. forever taking some backward steps. <laughs> yes, exactly. You um, Brent, you talk about RAD, R-A-D, um, in your book. And um, yes. can you explain what RAD means um, and the elements associated with that? Sure. So RAD is my SoCal uh, acronym for uh, resilient. And so the resilient really is that it's like the palm tree on the shore, you know, strong roots into the cliffside. Um, usually the, the roots are built upon sort of the DNA of the company, what is their driving force and how did they get to be successful? And there's a lot of founder energy often or, you know, the experience or their expertise or their competitive advantage or whatever you want to call it. And that sort of creates this the strength of the company, but you also then have to be able to bend in the wind when you get the, the tropical storms. And so that's sort of my idea of resiliency. You need the strength, but also the flexibility. The A is for awareness and Again, this is sort of the the idea that information is coming into the company from the edge doesn't emerge from the the beginning, the center. Uh, You know, I think during most of the industrial age, risk was in the technical. Can we build something? And in and in operational risk, can we build it inexpensive or efficiently enough that the middle class could afford it? And that was just really the boom of the 20th century. And Today, that's not true. We know we can build it. We know we can operationally do it. Uh, The risk is on the market side. And so we have to be closer to our customers. We have to have our ears open to changes that are happening. Like, gee, why are all these factories closing down in China in in December of 2019 or whatever? So it's like 
understanding what's going on on the other side of the world that actually might affect our own uh, uh, our own economies. And then the ability, like I mentioned earlier, to establish new communications flows. So this is something that I haven't seen a lot of agile people talk about is this idea that if you're changing from top down communications and now all of this information is happening on the edge and teams are empowered to take care of customers and to change products in order to solve issues, what's the new communications flow and who has consciously implemented a new communications flow so that other people in the organization become more aware? And then the last D is dynamic. And so that's building into the company. You alluded to this uh, a bit with your, um, when you were talking about the uh, the governance, mm -hmm. the, you have to build into the organization the ability to change your course of action, right? So it's, it's this dyna dynamism. So the D is for dynamic. And so it's not enough just to be agile and do, okay, new information change, but actually building into the organization this ability to have uh, interdisciplinary decision-making and a diversity of skills and, and decision-making. And really what you want is to advance people inside the company that are willing to change as opposed to the old school way of advancing people in the company that are towing a particular line. And it, this is very difficult to do, but I think that I think that it's fast moving digital companies tend to stay fast moving and digital if they're able to build that into the organization. Um, so that that's rad. And and in the book, um, Brent, you also talk about empowering people. How how would you um, or can you give an example of how you would empower teams in in turbulent times? We've obviously seen that in the last few years. Um, can you give some examples of maybe recommendations you've made to organizations or things you've used with your own teams? Yeah, so it, it's um, it's hard as a manager, I know, for my own teams. You, you kind of want to just say, you're empowered, and, and they'll go off and be empowered. But you actually have to teach what empower, empowered looks like. And so, I mean, it's kind of a silly little example, but there are times in Slack where I'll know the answer, but the answer, that question wasn't directed at me. And and mm -hmm. it, the old me would have just, because of the speed and efficiency, has thrown that answer out there and been on my way. But instead, it's like, no, sit back, let the team figure it out and handle it. So that's like a sort of a minor little example. But it, it, it works in a larger context as well. So uh, there's a couple of case studies in my book, uh, uh, ING, including ING in Australia, that was, mm -hmm. you know, reacted to to COVID where the teams themselves, it was really kind of funny the way the CEO, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but the way she was putting it is that a bunch of companies were using, a bunch of banks were using that opportunity to go digital uh, and ING was already digital. And so what they were doing was using that opportunity to go analog. And in mm -hmm. other words, they were actually calling customers up and talking to them on the phone and checking in with them to see how they're doing. And I love that example because everybody's always oh, digital, 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 but yet that ING in Australia went for this human connection. And so it was empowering the teams to be able to go do that, pick up the phone and go talk to your customers. Mm -hmm. And so that's a sense of empowerment. Um, there's a, a, there was a city in the Bay Area called uh, Hayward, and it's sort of a poorer city compared to all of the Silicon Valley cities that are around it. And in March, early March of 2020, the fire chief said, you know, I've got two paramedics have been exposed to COVID. They can't come into work and there's no way to test them. I think I should set up a, a, a testing center. And uh, the uh, city manager goes, all right, go figure it out. And so fire chief went off and found a lab with capacity and set up the very first public free COVID testing like in the US but before the end of March 2020. And again, to me, that's just like absolutely extraordinary and just this great example of go do it, go make it happen. And so um, I think that there's all sorts of, of uh, all sorts of examples. We did this uh, accelerator program for uh, division of Roche. And at the beginning, we we have, uh, I don't know, we must have had 100 or so people. 
and they were all it was a very hierarchical organization. They're in healthcare, so they're not allowed to go off and just talk to customers, or so they thought. And they were just so scared, so nervous. They didn't really believe they were allowed to go do this. And the boss, their boss, was just this giant of a man, must be, I don't know, 6'4", 6'5", and, and heavy set, and just really powerful man, but very soft-spoken. And he told this great story about how he, one of his first jobs, he had to dress up as a dinosaur and go and meet customers or something like that. And so he was just trying to give people this example of, like, even big, powerful, hierarchical leader will, will go off and do these type of things. And the other thing that was really interesting about that particular situation was that people thought that they were going against compliance laws to go and talk to the customers. And so we had the head of compliance send out a memo that basically said, here are the rules of the game. You have to say who you are, who you're from, and just generally that you're out trying to improve product experiences and that you want to learn from them. And just by saying those things, there was no legal ramifications. Mm. People were still nervous after that. But before the end of 90 days, 90% of the people were just like, I never want to go back and work the way we were working. Before. This was so much fun and it's so rewarding. And again, it gets back to that ability to exercise your own creativity and your own problem solving and, and those type of things. Um, and so that was a that was sort of a big program. But that same thing can be caught you know, you can catch that in your organization just one team at a time by starting next week mm -hmm. and just by starting, you know, don't take something that's big and risky. Take something that's small but has this level of uncertainty and will drive some amount of impact to the organization by empowering a group of people to go solve the problem. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of people, as we were saying earlier, that um, have have it, have that innate sort of entrepreneurial spirit within them. They may never run a business, but inside, like I know I was one of those and I was feeling quite um, suffocated, I guess, by corporate because I had all these ideas and but without it going through five or six levels of approval, nothing would get done. So hence why I sort of moved into startup land, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but it's really interesting because if you give people those opportunities, they're more likely to be loyal. I mean, hearing about the great resignation and, mm -hmm. And I, I was listening to a podcast this morning and they were talking about it's not about that. There's, there's some people that aren't even going to apply for these jobs because they're finding other ways. So big corporates need to make um, make opportunities in there to be able to, I guess, build on that entrepreneurial spirit in, or entrepreneurs, I think is what they call them. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I listen, I was never a founder of a company either. I founded Moves the Needle, but that was quite a bit later. And, and so I never thought of myself as being an entrepreneur either. But I think the mindset is exactly right. There is a certain level of risk that some people are willing to go to to go start a new business. But the first mm -hmm. 10 employees are really what you're talking about. You know, they sort of have that. They want to be in charge. They want to drive impact. They want to make the decisions. And there's just a lot of people that way. And there always will be plenty of roles for the people that don't want to be work that way. But exactly. you should design a company so that the ones that do mm -hmm. are empowered to do so because that's actually going to what, what's going to make your company thrive and and survive in the digital age and don't assume ask them um, we are we had less than 10 people <laughs> yes. i regularly ask the team what did you enjoy the last quarter most and what did you dislike and to try to sort of adjust the team and what they're doing so they can keep you know being motivated but um but yeah the speed of in, speed and innovation in companies globally in the during the pandemic was just awe inspiring for to see some of the the innovation not only in the small you know businesses or businesses that were built off the back of COVID, but also large businesses and some of the things that they did, like the example you gave. We had a um, a gentleman on our podcast a little while ago and he was in the events business, um, really, really, really big company in the events business in, in Australia and all of their work dried up, 98% was gone. And so the, the co-founder had this um, passion for furniture, just that he'd never sort of itched. And they decided to make a, a, a sort of a stand-up a stand desk from home, one piece of furniture. Now they're making millions of dollars on <laughs> furniture sales. It's absolutely amazing. amazing. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> remarkable. But it's great to see that. And that's what we need. Like you said, pick an area that's low risk, you know, um, and give people the autonomy to maybe make some mistakes. And that's not a bad thing. That's right. And then I think once the trust is built, then you can start going towards the bigger issues. And that's really where you're going to see the big impact happen. Absolutely. hundred percent. 
Um, selfishly, I want to talk a little bit about startups and, and small business um, as obviously being a small business myself, uh, as I mentioned, moving out of corporate into small business land. Now, I know you've written a book, The Lean Entrepreneur, which you briefly mentioned before, and you have some impressive contributors. You had Eric Rees, who's the author of The Lean Startup, actually write for Forward. And then Seth Godin actually has a quote that he's obviously read and written, uh, read and written about your book. How did how did that come about? I'm so fascinated because I'm, I'm fans of both of them. Uh, well, so the so I actually wrote the first book that talked about lean startup and customer development and product market fit. So that was a self published book that came out before Eric's book. So I was wow. I was blogging about stuff that was similar when somebody turned me on to Steve Blank and then and then Eric Reese. And so I there was a small core group of people in a Google group that were talking about all of these things and how to apply them. And so really the opportunity was that nobody had written kind of the how to in a modern way. Uh, Steve Blank's book was a, a collection of lecture notes, really. And so it wasn't really a purposely written book. And so myself and Patrick Laskovitz jumped on the opportunity and wrote a, uh, the first book that talked about all of that stuff. And so Eric, Eric was a friend. I mean, I knew Eric and, and attended all of the Lean Startup conferences and, and, and all of those type of things. His book was phenomenal and sort of just blew the top off of the market. But there again, his book really didn't say how to do it. Like you can't really read Eric's book and then go, okay, now I'm going to go do it. Mm -hmm. And so the Lean Entrepreneur, again, was sort of a deep dive on how to do it, how to talk to customers, how to run experiments, what that means, what data you should focus on. And so that was really, you know, those kind of things, just the first couple of books just launched a new, new career. The Seth Godin thing is, I think it just speaks to what an amazing person he is. So, you know, this stuff was pretty hip and it was getting some amount of traction. A lot of people were push, pushing back on the idea because they wanted to see it work first and then everybody can jump on the bandwagon. And so I just reached out to him. I just reached out and said, Seth, you know, I enjoy your work. And I wrote about a little bit about the lizard brain in, in, the, in the book. And, and uh, I'd love for you to, to take a look and, and blurb it. And I don't know, within an hour or something, he had, he had re replied with a blurb. So uh, to me, that just speaks to who he is that, you know, uh, there's a lot of people who try to pull the ladder up when they reach success. And then there's there's other people who, who reach a, a hand down and, and, and help others along. And, and Seth is definitely uh, one of the latter. A hundred percent. I've had some email exchanges with him over the last couple of years and he he's definitely one of it. I mean, just to get a response as quickly as we did and, you know, to have to hear. I haven't written a book though. Um, written a couple of ebooks and a couple of white papers, but books next on my list. So tell me, how do you, how do you like bring all the pieces together when writing a book? Um, as did it take you years, months? Are you going to give me any tips? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's uh, they've all been different. So the first book, the self-published book, Entrepreneur's Guide to Customer Development, almost wrote itself in four months just because all of those ideas were already swirling around in the brain. The Lean Entrepreneur was more of a slog because I was really trying to bring together things that hadn't really been brought together before. Like, I think that Customer development, in the end, I don't think is that great. I think design thinking is better, and design thinking brings in sort of the empathy portion of it. And so I was talking about empathy in the lean startup world before before I had really figured out that there was this whole design thinking thing, which I totally give credit to nowadays. But back then, I just didn't really know about it. But I was talking about the empathy thing beyond customer development because customer development was just a little bit too, I don't know, too interviewee like too too vanilla. And what you really needed to do was get deeper. Um, and so uh, I think that uh, that book, I kind of had to workshop it for a couple of years. So it took a long time to write that book. And so I was traveling all over and trying to figure out how to do the value stream stuff in there and what works for people and what resonates. And so uh, you kind of live in it. And then this last book really came from working with large organizations for the last 10 years. And I started writing it right when COVID hit. And uh, and that was kind of crazy because it really changed the flavor of the book. I think I started out with sort of here's 10 years of working with innovation teams and this is all great. And, and you know, this is what how you make real change happen and some of the things that we've been talking about. But then what I got to see was 
these different organizations that I had, some of whom I had worked with, some of them that I hadn't, but that had practiced some of this entrepreneurial spirit for years and years. And you get to see how well they responded to COVID. Mm -hmm. And so it's very rare that you can actually kind of come up with a model, at least in social sciences, it's very rare to come up with a model and then see it put into place and then have the re the result that you should be seeing out of it, right? I mean, it's kind of the difference yeah. between social science and science. Mm -hmm. And so there's a bunch of those case studies in the book, and that was super rewarding to see uh, those people that had completely embraced this lean innovation stuff, which is my word for combining design thinking and rapid experimentation and agile to have the success that they had. So that was really cool. That was also kind of a book that was difficult for me to, to get out. In the end, I think it's a little bit too, too complex, um, but has a lot of great stuff in there, I think, but it's not a, not a casual read. Mm -hmm. But so when it comes to advice, biggest advice is it's a product. And so treat it like a product. And so all of the stuff that you know about Agile apply to the production of the book. And, and so that includes the, your, your sprint planning and your, uh, your checking in with stakeholders and, and uh, improving and all of that stuff applies to the book. Um, you know, it's, there's sort of bigger questions about whether to self-publish or go with a, a publisher. Um, and that's probably more than can fit into this conversation, but I'm happy to have that conversation with you if you'd like. Um, it, it really just kind of depends on what you're what you're really truly hoping to get out of it. Absolutely, no, that's really good advice. I, I think you're right. I, every, I always say to people, everything we do almost is project related. Um, you know, whether you're planning your birthday party, building a house, etc. But you're right, writing a book. Um, very simply, we've you know got we've got the work breakdown structure. Manage it in sprints sounds like a really good idea. Um, you'd think I already would be doing that, but I'm not. But um, probably spend a bit more time emphasizing. It's interesting. You you spend a lot of time telling people how to do things, and sometimes you forget to take your own advice on some things. I mean, oh, I try to absolutely. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's just, it's just you're so busy. It's like the the hairdresser. You, you go to the hairdresser and, and their hair is all scruffy looking. They haven't made any effort, but they do amazing outputs on their products. So it's uh, <laughs> a bit like that sometimes. <laughs> in, in the US, we call we call that eating your own dog food. Yes, yes. I've heard that saying before. I've got a guy in my team who constantly says that. And I was like, what does that mean exactly? I mean, I conceptually get it, but it's just such a really random thing to say but I've heard of that one um, there's a, few, <laughs> a few other uh, sayings and terms I've learned so apparently in the US you 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 call them uh, bullet points we call them dot points um so, so I've had that debate with some people that I've worked with in the US. <laughs> I'm that's, sure that that's a whole other podcast I'm sure there's one there out there like the comparisons um just sort of kind of kind of ramping down I, I wanted to um just ask one one of my um sort of final business C questions is we we you're probably familiar with the 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 words that Reid Hoffman usually says around building the airplane whilst flying it. Um, he constantly says that in his podcasts, you know, all the time. And I'm I'm kind of interested in what you've seen. You've worked with big business. You've worked with small business. You've been in business yourself. What would you recommend in terms of balancing all the things you need to do? when you just don't have all the time available to you? Is there any techniques you've seen some of the businesses you've worked with, particularly the smaller ones, that have really benefited them and helped them, particularly when they're low on time and budget? Yeah, I, it's it's definitely a tough one. I mean, there's a couple of philosophical things that I talk about all the time. I think that, the um, to me, the CEO's job is to deal with uncertainty. And, uh, and so basically they're in charge of learning something about their business about how the business is going to succeed and the moment they've learned that they need to be able to pass it on to somebody else so it's either automated or it's given to lower cost lower skilled people that can do it well enough that and then you're on to the next thing and so as a founder or ceo you're always looking for the bottleneck to growth and that could be it could be improving the product so that you're getting more engagement it could be somewhere in the marketing funnel it could be you know really sort of any part of the business. And so trying to create, this is a lot of this is in the lean entrepreneur is to try to create some sort of a dashboard, even at the beginning, it's sort of analog that allows you to understand the flow of a customer first becoming aware of a product all the way to becoming passionate. And where should I be focusing my energy that if I, if I solve this problem, I remove this bottleneck, we should see some level of growth. 
and philosophically that it's the CEO that should be leading that and then passing off that learning to somebody else. Eventually, if the company is successful and it gets bigger enough, you have other people that can take on those different parts of the bottleneck simultaneously. And that's sort of how you start how you start scaling mm -hmm. for, for weighing things that are are going on, like just maybe in your sprint planning or whatever. I've used two by twos that are like, what is the well, I want to separate out where's the uncertainty. So high impact, ver vertical impact, like this is how much it's going to impact the business in a positive way. And then another axis is how well do I know, how confident I am that we have the understand the problem and understand, and have the capabilities of solving that. And so your upper, your upper right is this is high impact and this is known. We're very confident. And so this is actually where you're putting a bunch of your energy. Mm -hmm. And then there's high impact and unknown. And this is where you actually have to do some exploration work. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to invest in the time to learn because if I figure out any of those things, they're still high impact and they're going to move over into the high impact known bucket. The lower right is lower impact, but known. And so that's just sort of a scheduling thing. Those are things that maybe you know you have to do and so you're kind of that's where you're kind of chipping away at them and then low impact don't know you're kind of leaving those alone mm -hmm. so that i try to get it's one frame one way of trying to prioritize yeah. where you're putting your your energy yeah, makes a lot of sense, especially if, if you you know, some people are like me, I have a bit of a monkey brain and I've got a million things I'm trying to do all at the same time and don't have the, an endless budget, unfortunately. And it's about, yeah, force, force prioritizing some of those things and not getting distracted with all of the shiny things that could take up time, but may not be as high value um, as you pointed out. So yeah, I can right. definitely resonate with that. Personalkanban.com is actually got, has a lot of resources where one can use like their own uh, Kanban board to help th with that sort of thing. And I kind of have my own version of that, um, which you may, and your audience might be interested in. Uh, mm -hmm. I've got a video on it that maybe I can just share, but it's, uh, it's this idea of building in the other parts of your life that are important. And so as swim lanes, so you've mm -hmm. got all of the, the work stuff that you need to do to run your business, but then you've got a swim lane that is the book that you're writing. Mm -hmm. And then you maybe have another swim lane that are things like family or personal wellness. And, you know, like a good Kanban board, you have all of these things that you could be doing, and then you have your work in progress, and then you have your, your done. And yeah. the key is, is that you can only have three items in your work in progress column at any point in time. But you can pull from any of those swim lanes or the work stuff. So if you're feeling unenergized, you've got low energy, then maybe you pick, you don't pick from the, the work one, you pick from, you know, some personal wellness thing. And so that that's what you work on. Or you make sure that every week or every couple of days, you're choosing something from the book thing so that you know that you're chipping away at it. Yeah. Um, so that's another technique that one can do to make sure that they're really touching on all of the different things that make them uh, a contented human being and, and, and not just kind of stuck in, in just the work mode or in this arbitrary w live life work balance. I like that a lot. Um, we use the, the Kanban method for project management offices typically, because I believe that project management offices shouldn't be built around a methodology. They support delivery who does deliver using methodologies. So having sort of a Kanban approach to the PMO is actually really useful because not only that, that it helps them to organize and prioritize, but actually is a transparent aid for the stakeholders who want to understand where they're, you know, what 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 PMO is doing every day and sometimes the challenging what they're working on. It's like, have a look at what we're working on and tell us what you want to reprioritize. So I, I love that tool. Um, but yeah, definitely happy to share the video in the show notes for sure. Cool. Awesome. Well, that's um kind of bringing us to to the sort of end of our um conversation today, which has been so um so great and i'm sure we could have a, a lot more time to talk to get together and keep going on this sort of fascinating conversation around all these things i do have a couple of rapid fire questions for you before we close for today um so if you're ready i'll kick off with those okay go for it so what was the last book that you read not including yours the last book i read 
uh, got through a bunch of them uh, halfway, but actually probably the, the last one was maybe The Deficit Myth by uh, Stephanie Kelton. Um, that book, I think, has gotten some traction in Australia. So it's I think it's a super important book these days for all of the crazy economic things that are going on. Um, in a nutshell, uh, she talks about the fact that uh, budget deficits – Federal budget deficits for governments that produce their own currency are not an accurate measurement of whether we're spending too much money or not. And so people are, are focused on the wrong metric and uh, and that we don't really have to worry about running deficits up to a point where it might cause inflation based upon a bunch of other factors. But it's, it's super interesting and uh and super powerful if uh, if we could just get our our politicians to grok it. Mm -hmm. Get our politicians to do quite a few things. I think things will be better. But uh, <laughs> what is something that you do that most people would consider strange? Oh my gosh! <laughs> well, actually, probably all you you all would probably think that my pickleball is strange. Has pickleball reached Australia yet? It has not pickleball. reached Europe. No, I'm I'm not familiar with that. What is pickleball? Yeah, yeah. So pickleball is just like the fastest growing sport in the U.S. There's actually already multiple pro leagues. It's on TV already. And basically it's played on like half the size of a tennis court. It's a hard paddle with a ball that's kind of like a wiffle ball. It's a bunch of holes in the ball. And yeah. so it doesn't travel as fast. And so what it does is that it slows the game down just enough that it sort of levels the playing field. You have old people play young people, women beat men and, uh, and it's very fast paced, but there's also this whole dinking strategy uh, that makes it interesting. And it's just taking the world by or the, the country by storm. It's really kind of extraordinary. And uh, so, yeah, I, I encourage people to go check out a, a game of pickleball on um, on YouTube. And I'm hoping the next time I go to Australia, that there'll be pickleball going on. There you go. I haven't heard of it, but I'm not very sporty. So it could be that it's here and I'm just completely ignorant to it but uh, i will check that out for sure <laughs> it hasn't reached europe and one of the greatest things about it is that unlike tennis that it's really difficult if you're not a good player to find somebody to play with and go out and have fun mm -hmm. anybody can have fun with the sport in 30 minutes i mm -hmm. guarantee it i like the idea of it also being like you said so you can slow slow down i think we all need to slow down a little a little bit so <laughs> that sounds good totally. um I, nothing nothing uh nothing's more slower than golf to me <laughs> like, anyway, we, won't, we won't talk about that one um i might have some future golfers on the podcast and they might not like it um how how can people get involved with your work and with moves the needle and obviously your book is is the website best place is there something specific you'd like them to go to find well so let me throw a few things out there basically i'm brant cooper on all social media my email address is brant at brantcooper.com and i encourage people to to reach out to me if they'd like. I, I respond to all messages. Uh, if there's any corporate interest, uh, you know, medium sized to large businesses, then uh, movestheneedle.com. People can find out more there. And then for the more startup, small business, entrepreneurial side, there's a website called startupbluebook.com. And I'm developing some some courses on that for people to uh, learn about some of the things that uh, that I teach and that, and that my company does so that was startupebook.com startup blue book blue book okay beautiful i'll put that in the show notes as well oh, sounds cool, like you're you. a very very busy very busy man is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners a call to action a piece of advice or a question to ponder to close us out today yeah and you know i always sort of leave with go talk to a customer i think that even uh at this in this age uh, where everybody's talking about so much about understanding customers and customer centricity, it's still amazing to me that it's very difficult to get people to go out and talk to their customers. Mm -hmm. And when you go out and talk to the customers, it's not about just like asking for features and it's not just about, you know, trying to sell your solution. Try to understand what are the needs that they're trying to address. Try to understand them on a deeper level. I think that competitive differentiation these days comes from insights that you have on your customers that others don't have. And so go off and go find them. Amazing. Love it. Thank you so much, Brent. It's been an absolute 
pleasure having you on the podcast. I'm sure people are going to get a lot of value from the conversation. I wish you well um, in the coming months and years, and I, I'm sure we'll stay connected and um, I'll make sure I include all of this stuff in the show notes as well so people can connect with you on email and on your socials, which I've already done. So, um, again, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a fun conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Please share this with someone or rate it if you enjoyed it. Don't forget to follow us on social media and to stay up to date with all things Agile Ideas. Go to our website, www.agilemanagementoffice.com. I hope you've been able to learn, feel, or be inspired today. Until next time, what's your Agile Idea? Agile Idea.